What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, where we continue our reading of the Bitcoin Optag newsletter today, number 23, on November 27th, 2018. This week's newsletter provides a reminder about potential fee rate increases, summarizes suggested improvements to the SIG hash flags to accompany BIP 118, SIG hash no input unsafe, and briefly describes a proposal to simplify fee bumping for Lightning Network commitment transactions. Also included are selected recent Q&A from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange and descriptions of notable code changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items. Monitor fee rates. Recent reductions in the exchange rate are the likely cause of a modest decrease in hash rate and a possible increase in the number of coins traveling to or from exchanges, which could lead to increased fee rates during the next week. Unless there is a dramatic new change in hash rate during the next week, a difficulty adjustment is expected around Sunday that will mitigate most of the recent hash rate reductions. News. Sick hash updates. Peter Woolley started a threat on the Bitcoin, Gore, Bitcoin Dev mailing list, suggesting two additions to future changes to SegWit SIG hashes, especially BIP118, SIG hash no input, unsafe. A signature hash is the data commitment by, to buy a signature in a transaction. Normally, the hash commits to a list of which coins are being spent, which scripts are receiving the coins, and some metadata. But it's possible to sign only some of the transaction fields in order to allow other users to change your transaction in a specific way that you might find acceptable. For example, for two-layer network protocols. Woolley suggests two additions to what metadata is hashed. Both will be optional. But both can become the default for normal on-chain wallets. First, the transaction fee is included in the hash in order to allow hardware wallets or offline wallets to ensure that they are not being tricked into sending access fees to miners. Second, the script pub key of the coins are being sent is also included in the hash. This also helps secure hardware wallets and offline wallets by eliminating a current ambiguity, ambiguity about whether the script being spent is a script pub key, a pay to script hash, redeem script, or a SegWit witness script. Simplified fee bumping for Lightning Network. Funds in a payment channel are protected in part by a multi-sig contract that requires both parties sign any state in which the channel can close. Although this provides trustless security, it is an unwanted side effect related to transaction fees that the parties may be signing channel states weeks or months before the channel is actually closed, which means that they have to guess what the transaction fee will be in, the f in far in advance. Rusty Russell has opened a pull request to the bold repository and started a mailing list thread for feedback on the proposal to modify the construction and signing of some of the Lightning Network transactions in order to allow both BIP125 replaced by fee, fee bumping, and child pays for parent fee bumping. In a follow-up email, Matt Carolla indicated that the proposal is probably dependent on some changes being made to the methods and policies nodes use for relaying unconfirmed transactions. Selected Q&A from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. The Bitcoin Stack Exchange is one of the first places Optech contributors look for answers to their questions or when we have a few spare moments of time to help answer other people's questions. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. First, if someone wanted to pretend to be Satoshi, <coughs> fake Toshi, by posting a fake signature to defraud people, how could they tell? And that is a question asked by Gregory Maxwell. 
if a random fraudster wanted to pose a bunch of mysterious ECDSA signatures that the public would believe came from Bitcoin's creator in order to disrupt the Bitcoin market, extract money from people, or otherwise convince people to listen to them, how could they do that? I love that question. And here's a answer provided uh, by Gregory Maxwell as well and with some edits by Merch. So, long answer. Unfortunately, given the public's limited, public's limited of understanding of cryptography, this is apparently an easy fraud to pull off. <laughs> the key trick is that non-technical people are prone to believe things that are just sound jargony enough, and the technical people tend to think that they know a lot more than they actually do. <laughs> and so they're easily sent off into the weeds. In crypto systems, the details are more important than you could possibly imagine. So all you have to do is make a forgery that works for a slightly modified crypto system and then lots of people who think they understand how ECDSA works will rush out to claim the results hold. Most mo modifications that you can think of are sufficient to make the scheme insecure. So, for example, a couple years ago, <clears throat> Craig Wright, <coughs> fake Satoshi, <clears throat> claimed to prove he was Satoshi by simply copying some pre-existing signatures out of the blockchain and posting somewhat obfuscated instructions on verifying them. It was figured out pretty quickly, but still managed to fool a lot of people. <laughs> I wonder who that was. They were too caught up in the mumbo jumbo to think of the obvious. The modification in this case was that the message the scammer was claiming to sign has no relationship to the message that was actually signed. Kind of an important feature. <laughs> More recently, it appears that someone attempted something similar again, but this time signatures that were not from the blockchain resulting in quote-unquote verification from the developers of some B Bcash clients and an engineer at Red Hat. But it turns out that, well, again, that the attempt was a fake and people's partial but incomplete understanding of crypto burned them. As Bitcoin developer Peter Woolley notes, ECDSA signatures where the message isn't a hash and chosen by the signer are insecure. This time, the scammer just published hash, R, and S tuplets. The hash part of the ECDSA is integral to the algorithm. If the verifier does not rush run the hash themselves, the security proposed of ECDSA do not hold, and an existential forgery becomes trivial. This similar vulnerability was backed into, into the original op DSV opcode in BCH. It originally didn't hash the income data, the incoming data, but left it up to the user. But I reported it and they appear to have fixed it before deploying it. <laughs> if the verifier does not perform the hashes himself, but just accepts a large a value given by the signer, he becomes susceptible to the following. Given public key P, a random, a pick a random non-zero value A and B, compute R equals A times G plus B times P, and now R point X and R point X over B is a valid signature under key P for message has R uh, on X, uh, squared by A divided by B. This does not compromise the security of real ECDSA because you cannot find a message that has chosen, that has a hash chosen um, of R times X times A divided by B values. People should be weary of obfuscated or overly technical quote unquote proofs. It's things that look like a secure system, but for some reason have people verifying it without w working with raw numbers of co or code. 
Well, design cryptographic software put in a lot of effort to avoid users being fooled by stunts like this. This stuff is tricky and, and anyone could be confused into accepting a false proof if they were convicted to effectively implement a bespoke crypto system themselves. A crypto system is not secure simply because you personally don't see how to break it. Don't roll your own crypto. Here's an example, Sage script, to produce forgeries that will fool someone that accepts an ECDSA signature without hashing the message themselves. It works with any elliptical curve key, including one the forger hasn't seen a signature from before. And here's the script. This code produces fake forgeries of some sort that was used to trick people recently. And thank you again for Gregory Maxwell and Merch for this very insightful answer. We also have the next question proposed by Patoshi. How would one encrypt a message using a Bitcoin public key and use its private key to decrypt it? I have the following text string. This is a test message. Using my Bitcoin pub key, the Bitcoin address question mark, how can I encrypt this message? How would I decrypt the message using the Bitcoin private key? And we have here a answer by Peter Woolley. So thank you very much. Yes, this is possible. However, if I want to upfront state that this is not advisable for multiple reasons. One, Bitcoin's keys are intended to be single use for privacy reasons and leveraging them for encryption unnecessarily encourages treating them as a long lived identity. There may be ugly and dangerous interactions where when keys are used for multiple protocols independently. You're much better off just using systems that were actually designed for encryption than, than trying to piggyback of Bitcoin's cryptography. And implementing your own cryptography is very dangerous. In general, unless you know what you're doing and get plenty of review from experts, don't roll your own crypto. A scheme called ECIES exists that lets you leverage elliptical curve keys to create an encryption scheme. In short, it works by the sender generating an eph ephemeral private key K using a strong cryptographic random number generator with associated public key K equals K times G. Multiplication refers to the elliptical curve multiplication here computes an ECDH shared secret, where the secret is the hash of the public key, where the P is the public key of the recipient. Computes two systems as Sumeric keys, X1 and X2, using KDF seeded by S equal X1 and X2 is KDF of S. Encrypt the message M, using AES with X1 as the key to obtain C and compute a MAC on K with and C with X2 as a key. That is H is the MAC of X2 with K and C. And sends then K, C and H to the recipient. The recipient computes the ECDH shared secret using S is the hash of the public key where P is the, pri the private key, and computes the same two Sumeric keys, X1 and X2, and computes the same MAC of the H dash of MAC X2 of K and Z. And he verifies that H is, or H dash is H, and fails if not, decrypts the message using S and M dash and AECDS deck X1 of C. Again, thank you very much, Peter Woolley, for answering that. What is meant by transaction pinning? A question answer asked by John Newbery and edited by Merch. And we have here the answer by John Newbery. Transactions pinning happens when, one, I broadcast a transaction that signals opt-in replaced by fee. Two, the transaction does not get confirmed because the fee rate is too low and someone else broadcasts a new child transaction spending one of the outputs of my transaction. And I now can't bump the fee 
on the transaction unless I include a fee greater than that of the combined original transaction plus the child transaction, see BIP 125. If the child transaction in three is larger, for example, a commercial service sweeping up lots of transaction outputs, then the total fee that I'd need to pay for a valid replace by fee would be very large. In the scenario, my original transaction has been pinned by the child transaction. Russell O'Connor has proposed changing the replace by fee policy rules to alleviate this problem. And we have the last question of today asked by John about Schnorr batch validation. In the recent BIP about Schnorr's standardization, Peter Woolley presented an algorithm for batch validation. In my understanding, the most heavy operations is the multiplication by a scalar. To make batch validation secure, we need to multiply each public nonce by a random factor. Thus, we get back two multiplications per signature plus one. I don't understand why there, this is a speed up present in the figures at the beginning of the BIP. Could someone please help? Thanks in advance for your answer. And we got here an answer by Peter Woolley, the author of the BIP himself. You're right that the elliptical curve multiplication is indeed the most expensive operation in the validation algorithm. And as both single signature validation and batch validation requires two elliptical curve multiplications per signature, it would seem that no speed up can be gained from batching. However, several algorithms are known for computing the sum of multiple elliptical curve multiplications faster than summing the individual multiplications. Strauss's algorithm, also known as Shamir's trick, Boskaster's algorithm and Pipinger's algorithm all provide speedups and are applicable in different scenarios. In the graph in our BIP draft, Strauss and Pinkinger are used, depending on the size of the batch. Pipinger only wins for batches over 100 keys, and for sufficiently large batches, Bos, uh, Boskors and Pinkinger are O of log n, times faster than individual multiplication. To give you an intuition of how this is possible, here's a summary of Boskos algorithm. While in practice, it's not the fastest, it's the easiest to explain. You start with a list of pairs, key pairs that is, and you sort this list from large to small, to small a i, and renumber it so that a1 is now the largest number. While the list has a length larger than one, replace the top two elements and the two element and the two elements of a1 minus a1. And if this result is an element with coefficient zero, remove it. This happens when a1 equals a2, and then sort the list again. When only one element remains, it will be of the form a and a and p, where a is the GCD of all inputs from a sufficiently large n, that GCD will be almost certainly be one, in which case the solution is just p. Otherwise, uh, a will be a smaller number and the solution is just a p. The intuition here is that when you have, say, 100 multiplications to perform, a1 minus a2 will on average be 100 times smaller than the number it replaces, a1. So in every step, we're dividing one of the coefficients by 100 while only doing a single EC addition. This is in contrast with naive elliptical curve multiplication, where you generally need to perform one addition for each bit in the input. Again, thanks, Peter Woolley, for an answering that question. Returning to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter with notable code changes. This week in Bitcoin Core, L&D, C Lightning, and LIP at SEC P256K1. A Bitcoin Core merge prints a warning when unrecognized section names are used in the Bitcoin Conf configuration. For example, if you create the following configuration file using the name testnet instead of the correct name test, Bitcoin Core would previously silently ignore the testnet option. This merge pull request caused it to print the notice warning, section testnet is not recognized. 
Sea Lightning commit adds new fields in the result of the get info RPC. For a number of the node's peers, the number of pending channels, the number of active channels, and the number of inactive channels. This now matches information displayed by LND get info RPC. Another C Lightning commit strips the text Lightning prefix of Bolt 11 invoices before attempting to process it. This text is something added to, so that Lightning wallets can register it as a URI handler. The prefix text will be striped if it is all lowercase or all uppercase, but not mixed cases, per the BIP 173 BEC32 specification. And two C Lightning commits fix a problem with running multiple RPC commands in parallel. A as user visible change. Lightning D now adds a double new news line, <laughs> double new line instead of just a single new line to the final output from the RPC. As single new, li new lines may be used elsewhere in the RPC output terminating with a double new line makes it easier for non JSON parsers to find the end of the result from one RPC call and then beginning of the results from a subsequent call with the same socket is used for both. We have another Bitcoin Core merge adds the ability for the RPC Authenticate Pi script to accept a password on STDIN rather than as a command line parameter that might be stored in shell history. The script is the preferred way to generate login credentials for RPC access when not using Bitcoin CLI, as the same user has started the Bitcoin D daemon. Another Bitcoin Core merge changes the settings used to bind Bitcoin Core's RPC port to anything besides the default localhost. Previously, using the RPC allow IP configuration option would cause Bitcoin Core to listen on an interface, although still only accepting connections from the allowed IP address. Now, the RPC BIND configuration option also needs to be passed to specify the listening addresses. New warnings are printed for unlikely configurations and to, to advise users about the danger of listening on untrusted networks. It is hoped that this change will be reduce the number of nodes listening for RPC connections on public interfaces. The danger of which was described in the news section of newsletter 18. And another C Lightning commit enforces the Bolt 2 maximum amounts for channel and payment value after it was discovered that C Lightning wasn't obeying these limits. A future change will likely support an optional Wombo bit or Jumbo bit that allows the node to negotiate extra large channels and payment amounts. Peers, subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. And of course, thank you so much for all the contributors to this open source group. As always, a pleasure reading this newsletter every single week. And Peers, see you on the next show. Bye bye.